เห็นได้นะจริงๆถ้าถ่ายติดผ่านหลังที่ไปได้บ้างอะไรได้บ้างแล้วแล้วแต่ลุกเล่นเลยครับโอเคแล้วก็ไปจับจับตัวเขาโอเค First of all, it's my honor to have you today, and <laughs> do I look at the camera or look at him? look at him? Okay. 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 <laughs> this chair is not super comfortable. <laughs> okay. okay. So you can actually stand. Yeah, you can stand. Thank you. Okay. Okay. โอ้แต่แบบนึงมันก็มีมันมีวันก็พอไหวนะโอเคมาพอไหวนะรอดีกว่าโอเคครับโอเค first of all we will start the question being LGBT persons has an effect on the role of the duty of the digital minister or not yeah Well, uh, being transgender mm -hmm. certainly uh, doesn't affect the role mm -hmm. of digital trans uh, minister. But uh, I think a uh, trans minister has a kind of benefit in the sense of that I have gone personally through two uh, puberties. Mm -hmm. And so even though digital is not strictly speaking mm -hmm. uh, about just ICT, it's also about a lived experience of how everybody experiences new technologies like self-driving vehicles, like 5G and things like that. So having gone through two puberties, I think enabled me to do, uh, build more empathy with people in different circumstances and also their different takes uh, on the space uh, shift of technology. Oh. Why did you decide to work in the political area? And what do you believe in? Uh, I think uh, I have always worked in the politics, uh -huh. uh, except it's not representative politics. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was 15 years old, uh, I quit high school mm -hmm. to start uh, my first startups uh, on the wild web. And because of that, I participated in what we nowadays call internet governance, which is also politics, but it's about the standards and norms and protocols that people on the internet use. Uh, because internet is just by voluntary association, people mm -hmm. uh, adhere to those protocols and forms spontaneously in their work. And because of that, it's also politics. Oh. Uh, if you just participate in standard making, in language making, in specification writing, and things like that, it's all politics. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what I'm doing, what I'm believing in, mm -hmm. is that I'm taking the lesson that I learned as mm -hmm. a 15 years yeah. old. Uh, that's radical transparency, mm -hmm. civic participation, rough consensus, and so on, and taking it into the realm of everyday politics. Oh. Right. And uh, what is the more the challenge situations as the um, the first Taiwan trans minister. What's the first one? Uh, more challenging situations. Mm -hmm. The most challenging situations. I, I don't think there's anything that's particularly challenging uh -huh. uh, as a trans minister. Um, people generally accept me as I am. And when I was um, filing my HR form, mm -hmm. uh, basically I filed uh, none uh, in the party affiliation because I don't belong to any political parties. Uh -huh. And next to it is the gender field which I also said none. Uh, and so it, it, it's kind of uh, famous uh, in, in for a few day or two, uh, oh. but then people forgot about it, and they generally accept me as you know, being non-partisan oh. and also oh. as gender. Okay. Um, in your opinions, what is the most obstacle factor that makes the LGBT people in Taiwan still struggle to uh, in their life or cannot come out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it really changed after marriage equality. Mm -hmm. Before the marriage equality, I would say, of course, there is homophobia, transphobia, mm -hmm. and things like that, and generally come out from people not understanding the mm -hmm. different uh, lived-in experiences, but also the common experiences that all the couples face, regardless of their gender or sexual preferences, and things like that, right? And so uh, after marriage equality, uh, we see many people mm -hmm. much more willing to mm -hmm. come out and also to talk to their families, and they start thinking that oh, really there is no that much difference after all. We not only have our first writings uh, uh -huh. in marriage equality, yeah. but also first divorce as well. Uh -huh. And so really there is not much difference. Um, 
How could Taiwan use the technology to support and protect the LGBT rights? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think LGBT right is human right. Uh -huh. So we're not specifically saying just LGBT right, but mm -hmm. all human rights mm -hmm. in general. Right? Right. That people mm -hmm. deserve okay. equal treatment regardless of their ethnicity, their different languages, their different cultural identities, and things like that. In Taiwan, we have a specific way to, to ensure that. That is the dashboard of, of gender equality. So gender equality dashboard is a novel um, impact assessment way. Uh, all the different regulations, all the different policies must go through gender impact assessment. And so even for the ministry, they are usually not concerned about gender issues. Mm -hmm. They are kind of forced to go through the impact assessment. And the Gender Advisory Council is uh, assembled uh, by ministers on one half and with the civil society organizations on the other half, but with CSOs having one more vote than the ministers. And so that not only ensures that the CSOs keep uh, us honest, but also those independent assessments are also assessed by the external experts uh -huh. on gender issues and like that. So because of that, after 12 years of keep measuring the impact mm -hmm. and making sure that uh, the right uh, key performance indexes are on the gender dashboard, I think the general awareness of the public service has really increased and that prepares the public servants to adapt to say marriage policy uh -huh. or any other LGBT related mm -hmm. issues. This is what we call gender mainstreaming. Mm -hmm. Um, if we have to uh, opportunity to form uh, one policy for the LGBT community, what is your aim? Mm -hmm. So uh, we're actually rolling out a new uh, EID card uh, uh -huh. starting next year, mm -hmm. and in it we have um, made room for people with a neutral gender. So uh, either intersex people who have not assigned their own gender, mm -hmm. or as some Europeans have been advocating, that anybody uh, must assign their gender you know, only when they're comfortable with it, not at birth. Right? So all these different possibilities uh, are now made possible by uh, moving a binary gender system mm -hmm. in our computer programs, uh, in household registration and so on, to first allow foreigners who already have a neutral gender mm -hmm. to uh, also have the same uh, memory system in our national identity card, mm -hmm. and also the possibility of our national identity card to allow for the zero agenda, uh, which is gender undetermined or non-binary. Oh, okay. okay. Um, the next question is, what is the very first step of Taiwan after allowing you know, same-sex marriage as the first nation in Asia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, definitely we're trying to export our system because um, in uh, the Taiwan Act, uh, we can allow legally weddings with foreigners uh, that are mar marriage equal, but only if their jurisdictions also admit marriage equality. And so if the jurisdiction doesn't allow marriage equality, there's no way in the Taiwan law to recognize that particular wedding, even if they are wed in Taiwan. And so uh, what we have seen in the Asia is that uh, people are generally okay with the couples enjoying the same rights mm -hmm. and duties uh, or when it comes to public service. But people in here in Asia also care about the in-laws, right? The relationship between families. So father-in-law, mother-in-law. Mm -hmm. In Taiwan, we have like uh, dozens of different words just for aunt and uncle, right? Mm -hmm. So for, for English, it's just two words. <laughs> but, but in um, our language, there's many, many words. So because of that, when we're legalizing marriage equality, we, we make sure that we only legalize the bylaws, mm -hmm. but not the in-laws. So when two uh, same-sex uh, couples wed, uh, they have exactly the same mm -hmm. uh, right and privileges as the civil code oh. heterosexual couples. But oh. the chapter uh, on civil code that concerns the in-laws between the families, that is not hyperlinked. And so this creates a new uh, kind of relationship that is bylaws but not in-laws. And that made the conservative people that cares about how families uh, need to be uh, changes norms and so on, it gives them much more time and room uh, to evolve uh, concerning the uh, same-sex couples. So I think because our civil code is very close to that of Japan, mm -hmm. for example, uh, I think our next step is just to export this kind of idea uh -huh. and see that if it can Congrats. take hold uh, uh -huh. in East Asia. Um, the next question is, in your opinion, what Taiwan society will look like in the next decade, especially LGBT community, mm -hmm. in your opinion? Yeah, I think the LGBT community uh, will uh, be much more visible. Mm -hmm. uh, already
already we're seeing a lot more um, commerce and economy around the wedding industry, right? <laughs> but it's not just wedding, uh, it's all sort of uh, different social configurations mm -hmm. that can give rise to different norms and things like that. And so I think the society will become much more tolerant and people will start focusing on the uh, other uh, parts of the society that are at the moment more excluded. For example, people who don't have voting rights because they're uh, new immigrants uh, or they're migrant workers uh, and things like that. And I think those issues, those social issues, because of LGBT have a lot of intersectional mm -hmm. uh, friends, um, both in the, for example, labor rights uh, and also environmental right and even environmental personhood and things like that. So, so all these ideas are encouraged first by uh, women's uh, uh, equality and now by LGBT equality and like all the different human rights camps work naturally together to transfer their experiences and their strategies to enable more excluded people to enjoy the same human rights. Yeah, that's great. And um, most important factor that Thailand to learn or to have about the LGBT right to step up like Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, just reading uh, the translation mm -hmm. of our gender mainstreaming efforts, our gender impact analysis, uh, try to integrate that into the awareness of the mm -hmm. public service. I think that's the most important because in Taiwan, uh, after 12 years of keep assessing like mm -hmm. this, uh, we have one of the highest percentage of women in our parliament, uh, almost 40%, mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty high by Asian yeah, standards. Yeah, I mean, it's high. not North Europe, right? <laughs> but but uh, almost 40% is, is pretty good, right? Yeah. So, so I think that is the result of people looking at uh, generations of mm -hmm. role models of people participating successfully in yeah. politics, in public affairs, encouraging uh, more girls and women to choose uh, public affairs as their mission and their career. And once they do so, of course, it has a ripple effect so that the LGBT people can be more included mm -hmm. also uh, in the discussions and things like that. So just, I think, make it something that is uh, normal over the course of a long time, like 12 years, uh, and a new generation uh, will actually have a more open mind and will be able to have the languages and the ways uh, to convince or to uh, communicate with people of older generations to find out in a creative way what would be the best strategy to legalize marriage equality. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the last one, please say some things to the LGBTs, people around the world who are struggling to be themselves in San Jose in the for us surveying the price money. Okay, so I will quote my favorite lyrics uh, from the uh, singer Leonard Cohen, and it goes like this. Ring the bells, they still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything, and that is how the light gets in. Okay. Thank you. Wow. Thank you.